Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the first in the series of our Spring Back Talks. This is to support craft businesses um, all this summer, and we're going to be focusing on marketing in particular, kicking off with identifying your brand values. Before I come to our guest speaker today, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have a Q&A function. Please use this for any questions uh, that you might have throughout this talk. Um, and at the end of hearing from our guest speaker, Alexandra Lung, we will get to those questions. We will also have a poll at the end to gain your feedback so we can always improve these, these talks. And we also have two interpretations here, Ukrainian and Georgian, should you need that option. So without further ado, I'm going to get kick started. We are recording these sessions um, and we will be sharing these on our Crafts Council website uh, following these talks. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to set the context of why we're here today. Brand values in relation to your craft business. I won't uh, focus too much on the why because Alexandra is going to be focusing on that, but it's the rationale. Why are we focusing on brand values, the values of your business in relation to the whole of your business? Why is it important? And fundamentally, to understand why it's important, we do recommend that you do a body of research. And this could be research on a role model that you aspire to um, model your business on, um, how they structure their business, also uh, researching into other competitors. How do they talk about their brand? How do they talk about the values within their brand? And how is that aligned with your own brand values. Content. Once you've done your research and decided on, on how you want to talk about your brand values, it's starting to create some content so that you can inspire others to connect up with you in any which way, whether it's to buy into your products, buy into your services, connect up for future collaborations, connect up for promotion. So it's creating content. Then the structure, this is the mechanism for building your brand. Having a bit of a structure behind this, is this through um, your social channels? Is this through your web content? How are you structuring uh, the, the mechanism for building your brand? Planning, really important to plan anything into uh, your practice. So when are you going to make this happen once you've identified it? We always recommend planning backwards, setting a deadline, planning backwards. Talk about the mechanism. So you've got a vague idea of how you want to put this in place, then planning, creating a structure, and also finding out, do you need any financial um, support to support this planning? Connections, who do you want to talk about? Who do you want to tell? Who do you want to connect up to? Have you already got a mailing list that you can connect up to? Who is that community? Is that fellow peers? Is it that other organizations, retail? Is it industry experts? Or is it the press, is it the media? So thinking about your connections in, related, in relation to showing and identifying your brand values. Then administration, everything, the paperwork behind all of this making sure you factor in time to getting all of, as we call it, ducks in a row. The campaign, it's the long game. It's the long game behind um, how you want to promote what you do, uh, the plan behind it, everything that I've already expressed with the research, the content, the structure, the planning. What is the campaign to informing others about your brand values and why is that important? Analyze, always important to analyze your business. And so if you are doing a 
promotion and campaign behind your brand, your new brand values. Review it, reflect, adjust. The future, setting goals against um, this and, and trying to measure impact. Uh, so if you want to have future collaborations, future connections, develop your work creatively, trying to set some goals behind this so that as you drive your identified brand values, you can drive it forward to achieve these goals. Finally, legal, the requirements to have in place. And this is just a little bit about the logistics. Um, because a lot of brands can be associated with a business name or um, uh, some sort of logo, that sort of thing. And if you haven't registered a business name, but you wish to, it's always worth looking at Companies House uh, to see what has already been registered so that there is no conflict of interest there. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce our guest speaker today, who is Alexandra Lung from Lung Studio. Uh, Alexandra, if you want to turn on your camera and join us. Hi. Hi. Welcome, welcome <laughs> uh, to the first of our Spring Back Talks. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight all about how to identify brand values. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, and as I said, um, anybody who has questions, please pop them into our Q&A so that we can refer, refer to them at the end of this discussion. Over to you, Alexandra. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. So thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Alexandra. I run a branding and design studio based in East London, and we specialize in creating really bold and vibrant visual identities for clients who want to stand out with something different. Um, I used to roam around my father's wood workshop up in West Yorkshire, kind of terrorizing his colleagues and making wooden sculptures out of wood and anything else that I could find. We'd also go to the, or I'd accompany him to the old mills of um, the north of England to like salvage really weird and wonderful objects like cast iron objects um, and reclaimed floorboards. And then we'd go and make something or he would make something new out of that. And just that concept, the idea that you could make something out of nothing really, really excited me. So in 2017, I set up my own studio where we now provide um, like, our clients with a lot of strategic work on what their vision, goals and values are. And then that allows us to really create standout design work that's based on their vision and, and all of that good stuff um, so that we really tell their stories. And here are a few of the companies who we've worked with. You can see the Beast logo. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but the Beast logo and the W and ampersand um, they are two bespoke typefaces and they were only made possible thanks to giving our amazing typographer like a really clear and concise brief and that was thanks to getting aligned on um, the brand's purposes first of all so first of all we'll start with why start with why and then we're gonna do an exercise which is all about building your brand purpose then we're gonna look at a case study of a bigger brand and then we'll move on to a case study of a smaller startup brand. Then there's going to be an uh, exercise, which is defining your why. So the exercises are really fun and interactive. And if you don't have time to cover them in this session, because it's just half an hour, we will be, um, well, the Craft Council will be sending up a follow-up email with some notes and exercises to do in your own time, perhaps at the weekend. We'll look at social media marketing and how everything that you set out, like defining your vision and purpose has to be super clear so that that can be communicated across all touch points, like digital, print, and also just how you behave and act as a business owner or craft person. So why start with why? Um, it builds company culture. So as your business grows, it's really important to be crystal clear on your brand purpose. 
Beyond you need to make money, defining your why really is your driving force. You drive attachment and action with it. But it's also like going to be the thing that your key audience and customers and employees kind of use to associate whatever they do or purchase with your brand. Um, so they're really, really clever as well. They're going to spot inauthenticity or disingenuousness um, if things aren't quite consistent and clearly defined. So your why really has to drive. Um, sorry, your, your why really has to align to drive everything, including your mission, and goals and values. As Sophia Amoruso puts it, in whatever you do, you're not going to stand out unless you think big and have ideas that are truly original. That comes from tapping into your own creativity. That comes from not obsessing over what everybody else is doing. And I know that this can be like quite overwhelming. It doesn't really have to be that groundbreaking, especially with a craft-based business, like um, without wanting to contradict myself. It's, it's important to get clear on why you're doing what you're doing, but at the same time to not overthink it. Um, so Simon Sinek is a British American author and he's the author of five books, including why, start with why. So people don't buy what you do, but they buy why you do it. And here's his golden circle theory, which is in the center, why? Which is find your purpose. So what is your cause and what do you believe? And then how? So your process, specific actions taken to realize your why. And then what your process again, but what do you do? So the result of your why and the proof. If you've got any questions at this point, please um, just make a note of them and there'll be time to answer them all at the end. Um, but just looking at um, Patagonia as a case study. So why their purpose is inspiring and implementing sustainability in the outdoor industry. And then how is they use eco-friendly materials, fair trade practices, organic cotton, and you can see on the right, the picture kind of illustrates how build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use businesses to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. And this is really um, only made possible thanks to them being super clear on the reason behind what they do, it, why they do the work that they do. And um, it really goes across all touch points. So, although it's not that sustainable for their business um, or they're not making as much money, you wouldn't think to kind of recycle already used clothes. They also have a campaign which is to buy and sell old Patagonia pieces because it fits with their brand ethos. Um, so other brand purposes are, include Dove, who, who write, achieving real beauty and encouraging women to love themselves. Then Crayola's manifesto would be fostering creativity in children and Coca-Cola is spreading and sharing happiness. So creating a really clear and compelling brand is a series of choices. Figuring out who the brand is or aspires to be is really important, but moreover, it's about why you made those choices and how long they'll be relevant for. And it really doesn't have to be fluffy. Like the nature of craft is to make objects and things that exist to be enjoyed. Um, here's a piece of Vichinanka, which is um, my grandparents are Polish. Um, so I'm half Polish and Vichinanki literally translates to paper cutting and it was made thanks to the supply of um, coloured materials that were brought in in the industrial revolution to um, eastern Europe and this is made by my mum but it's um, inspired by the Volvic region of Vichinanke, how they interpret Vichinanke, so lots and lots of layering and this, you know, it's with art, if it was to be a piece of artwork, I guess there'd have to be another otherworldly meaning toward the piece, but it's literally just to decorate the barns and places in which they live. Um, and also a lot focusing on the process of the pieces because that's what it is, it's craft. Like it doesn't need to 
be super fluffy and it's important to not go into the realm of overthinking or to attach unnecessary meanings to your work and the reason why I have uh, Lucy Parker jewellery up here is because she's a client who came to us when she wasn't quite sure on her story and kind of how to tell it um, and I just kind of let her know look your work is stunning and maybe the fact that it's very no nonsense and just is very minimalistic and like the little black dress of jewellery is enough the fact that she loves doing it is really really important so I suggested to her her why could simply be something like I want to bring joy to the world um I want people to feel sophisticated when wearing my products um it's honest minimal and classic. It's quietly confident, celebrates nostalgia, and it's a subtle addition to any outfit. It's neutral and elegant, but also special. It's for anybody and everyone, and it doesn't try to be anything it's not. They're classless, beautiful, and standalone pizzas that speak for themselves. So, and you can see through her, the product shots here is just taken across a really kind of minimalistic background to let the pieces stand alone so no frills um if you want to follow her on instagram you'll see how her aesthetic is played out across um, the whole feed so it's lucy parker jewelry and yeah so here's a quick exercise so i'd like you to get a pen and paper now and just spend five minutes thinking about these emotions. So, or just on your phone as well, if you don't have a pen and paper to hand, if you can write, we want to help, or I want to help if it's, if you are your own business. Um, and then just think about who you want to help. And then how do you want to make them feel? And then when they interact with your product. So, It can seem a bit fluffy, but spending a decent amount of time thinking about this will be incredibly helpful when it comes to defining your brand values, the qualities that align you and distinguish you from your competitors. Um, IKEA, for example, they want to help people in their 30s feel stylish, comfortable, prudent when they interact with our reasonably priced furniture. <laughs> and then Savage and Fenty. We want to help all genders, all body types feel sexy, fun, fearless when they interact with our inclusive lingerie, lingerie. So yeah, just spend a few minutes thinking about your own product. And again, please take notes of any questions that you've got, so we'll answer them at the end. Yeah, and hopefully you've at least written those questions down so you can do them later on and you'll be getting the key takeaways at the end of this session. So another thing that Sophia Amorosa says, it's one thing saying to your team, team, this is how I want things to be done. And it's another saying, this is how we do things. So getting clear on your emotional appeal and like just these core values is gonna save you a lot of time and effort later on. So at Alexandralon Studio, our offering allows our clients to get a different perspective on their brand and to explore their audience at a greater depth. So Sus Cake Studio is a bespoke cake studio and for them, we designed a custom typeface, but this was only done because we knew that the client wanted to really challenge the norm of sweetness I'll challenge the concept of sweetness, which is often associated with something cutesy and very, very sugary. But what she does is make all of the 
kind of natural dessert tables out of um, sugar-free ingredients. So in that sense, we wanted to think about different ways of communicating that through typography. So study one, as you can see at the top, it's big and bold. And this study is inspired by the courage of opening a business during a very challenging time. So SUS, as you pronounce it, because it's got umlauts for the German audience, or how it should be pronounced, is a brand that is not afraid to make itself known despite the circumstances. Possible variations of the logo could have been created by changing the umlauts to a photo or illustration of a baking ingredient or tool. So that's why we have the chocolate drops and the cherries at the top. And then study 2A and 2B, the concept for this is all about reimagining the idea of sweetness being associated with something soft and cutesy to something that has a bit more bite. Um, so yeah, study two has two sub options. Um, 2A is edgy, quirky, a bit sharp, and then 2B is softer, friendlier, but also with a sharp edge. And then study three, since the brand is a cake studio, um, we thought it'd be a really nice playful way to use like piping and frosting to communicate that aspect of what she does. And really this could not have been produced without getting super clearly defined on her vision and goals and values. And that's what we did over a three week period. Um, so another way of like kind of communicating how her brand came to life thanks to that strategy session is through her marketing materials. So we created really free and playful illustrations because that's very much based on her experimental approach. Um, yeah, and then hopefully, as you can see, the typeface also tells that story. Um, but yeah, this is how it's played out across all marketing materials. And then another exercise is defining your own narrative. So this is um, taken from a Sonder and Tell newsletter. And if you're not taking control of your brand, others are definitely gonna do it for you. So again, this is gonna come in the key takeaways, but if you have a bit of time now, then use these sentence starters for your own brand. It's really, really simple, but really, really powerful. So what defines us is, dot, dot, dot. And then we are in the business of, you can read. So it's all about thinking about what's really important to your team culture and what makes you unique. So trust is the biggest asset that you can have. If you present yourself in one way in real life, it really needs to be aligned and consistent in the digital world too. If you've got a strong and consistent brand narrative that starts with a why, you can successfully build trust today. That's why it's so, so important to make sure that what you say aligns with um, what you promote online. And you can, again, the best way to do that is to get defined on your values at the beginning of setting up your business. And again, it doesn't have to be fluffy or it doesn't have to include a lot of flowery language. And just as a kind of key takeaway, important is to assess your target audience, where they are in the social media landscape. So audience who you're speaking to is equally crucial. Make it relevant. How can you really add value for your target audience and review your motivations every now and again. Why are you utilizing social media or whichever other platforms? And that's it. Thank you so much for joining and I look forward to hearing from you soon.
Thank you so much, um, Alexandra. And I, I'm sure this is sort of like stimulated quite a lot of uh, questions. Um, and, and I think um, very much uh, about identifying the why. And I, I must admit, I, I reference Simon Sinek a lot in um, the purpose behind what you do and, and how it feeds all into everything you say about your business. Um, and I, I did also want to reference here, if you are going for a funding bid or a crowdfunding campaign or a, a sort of a loan with a, a business bank, it all reflects, doesn't it, into why you do what you do. So I think actually on that, um, it will be quite interesting to hear from you um, if you've got a, an example or um, maybe tease out a little bit more on, on how identifying your brand values can feed into um, positive financial gain. Again, it's just all part of the same um, beast, isn't it? It's being able to clearly define who you are means that you're going to be more successful with marketing. Marketing is the key tool that's going to drive sales, for example. So for us, um, when we first started out in 2017, our strategy, our, our kind of ethos was to look at the world, like look at different cultures and interview artists and designers and craftspeople worldwide. Because we were just super interested in what made people tick and we thought that it would in influence our own design work. Um, but I didn't want it to be a vanity project either. So I just kind of used that as a way to, um, to do a bit of research because I didn't want to do a master's, for example. And that then was um, channeled through our monthly newsletters and also um, all of our other like LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And you can schedule things, I guess this is going off on a tangent, but when you get to the marketing talk and the financial talk, they really do go hand in hand. So because we were like building a soft brand awareness through this kind of secondary story or secondary theme, it really, didn't directly influence our sales because it was a very soft sell it was just building brand awareness it was something interesting but then our the other side of what we were doing was um to then have another monthly newsletter which clearly said okay um we do branding and design we can help you with this this and this and just making that message super crystal clear and yeah then our accountant was happy because um it did it worked and it still works i guess building a mailing list is one of our um the biggest sort of income that we have from it fantastic yeah so that that kind of as you you demonstrated the um identifying your your sort of brand values really helps define how you reach out to those potential consumers yeah. and ask them the questions that can feed into your business so that you can see business growth and the longer term impact so again yeah highlighting the the sort of why and and yeah and and I think I I another thing that sort of cropped up quite a lot um at the moment quite rightly is around about sustainability and being quite um appropriate in the materials that you use yeah. the processes that you use but I, I think, um, and maybe this, this could be quite an interesting topic, is when you're trying to identify the why and retaining that authenticity, Yeah. But um, how do you def um, uh, keep yourself being um, unique in, uh, against all these other buzzwords going around? How do you drag out that yeah. authentic um, yeah. words? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's so interesting because actually you just said it, authenticity. That's that's one that keeps coming up. Um, we do strategy sessions with a variety of new businesses and everybody wants to be authentic because it's just natural, isn't it? Um, but then there's also sustainability and being ethical. And we hear it all the time and you're in such a dangerous place to use those words without, without really living up to what you're talking about because it is greenwashing and jumping on the bandwagon and 
I don't know, it's everywhere. So I think it's probably more um, authentic to, to really think about what you make and what you do and only use those words if, if it really is like you're making jewellery out of bottle tops or something like that. Um, but otherwise, don't just throw those words in there. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. It's really sort of highlights um, of, of sort of making sure your message is really clear and that you can back it up with evidence. And I, I suppose yeah. um, on that, I'm I'm thinking in it doesn't have to just be words, does it? it that kind of you've already talked about um, a, a visual campaign. And so maybe talking more on the social side of things, again, once you've identified that brand really challenged yourself on yeah. um, those values of authenticity um maybe how do you bring that across visually uh, without maybe words how do you bring that across i guess that you kind of saw it with the sus um cake studio example um ultimately as well you can't really argue about taste i find if um if you know that you want something to look a certain way and sometimes clients come to us like with a mood board and it, it has to look like this we will try our very best to influence them to think about their audience and it's it's not like naturally you want something that you'd buy yourself but if it's not communicating to your audience then there's not that much point because your business isn't going to last that long is it it's um but then at the same time i guess people do um it's good when people know what they want as well. Yeah, yeah. It makes makes our job easier and I guess it brings another level of confidence. Um, yeah, I really that. like that word you use, taste, um, and that it, it's um, being authentic and true to what you're really interested and passionate about. Yeah. Uh, comes through in your, your own taste. We all have our, our own tastes. Yeah. And... Um, and I suppose not trying to put yourself into a, a certain genre because you feel that's where you need to be. Yeah. Can I just get something to show you? Yeah, yeah brilliant. <laughs> yeah. While Alexandra um, brings a, an example, I think that's something to uh, really think about when you're identifying um, your, your brand values is that um, being true to yourself, being true to your own tastes, um, and being true to the audience that you want to work with and who you want to consume your products. Uh, and rather than trying to go off on some tangent that yeah. um, you've, you've seen works for somebody else, if it's not authentic to you, then yeah. uh, focus on what is. Yeah, so don't look too much. Don't look too much out of the... Um, about what's going on, especially with Instagram. It's like a sewer out there. It's also like you go down a rabbit hole, don't you? And you really think like, it has to look like all these other brands and then it just doesn't become unique. And I was just getting this coat as a reference because um, it's from a client who we consult. It's like outerwear and it's made from um, some like um, recycled materials found in the ocean, but also cashmere and recycled cotton. Um, our client didn't, like have anything fluffy to say it's just that she wants to make a product that people can wear when they're out and about busy women perhaps mums going to pick up their kids but they want to look good whilst they're doing that and going about their other activities so it really doesn't have to be anything too over the top but um I guess another purpose of design is to solve problems so I guess maybe this does as well <laughs> <laughs> well it does but it's yeah. been really um key there what you were saying that this is somebody that's really passionate, obviously, um, yeah. about the source material, where it comes yeah. from. Yeah. And so have I, I've already gauged from what you've said. Yeah. The problem she's trying to solve is turning that source material into a functional item that yeah. people would use yeah. and, uh, in a very practical sense. Yeah. And that's what I've grasped from just your brief description. Yeah. Because it's yeah. all down to authenticity, isn't it? It is. And she's and we're concerned about using these words too often, sustainable and ethically sourced and everything. Although the product very much is, 
um, just because those words are out there. So it's really important to be super conscious of the context in which we're in right now, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely, yeah. And, and I think uh, I just wanted to draw upon the, the couple of exercises that you, you brought into um, the talk um, and, and sort of urging people um, to, to take the time to use that. And I suppose um, as a top tip from you, what would be the first step that you would recommend people doing? Um, is it about the research side of things? chatting to peers what would be the first step on identifying your brand values um that's such a good question i i think putting pen to paper because you can be walking around and having all these ideas going around in your head like our brain goes in loops and circles but just putting pen to paper and um, really crystallizing your thoughts helps so much so even start by thinking about what makes your product unique or why you uh, bringing it into the market I think doing that and putting yourself in the present is really key um, yeah 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 I like that phrase putting yourself in the present yeah. and um, uh, another thing I, I quite like is um, I mean I, I use it my uh, chatting to my sister who knows absolutely nothing about what I do I'm yeah. not really that interested <laughs> um, but if if uh, my sister can understand what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do then that's yeah that's a really good feedback isn't it it's finding that's such a good people. idea yeah yeah I think um it's really hard to get your family to really fully grasp what you do because they just love you for you don't they so <laughs> it's kind <laughs> yeah, of relevant yeah, really. <laughs> yeah yeah no, definitely yeah um and I think this is a really nice point actually to pull on questions um from from our audience and if I invite uh, my colleague Jill to join us Hello. who's been very kindly um, <laughs> looking at the the Q&A and, yeah. and the questions that may have come forward. Yeah absolutely lots of questions coming in. Um, I'm just going to sort of broadly group them. I think one of the uh, a couple of people asked this issue of we or I so this yeah. idea of sort of the person behind the brand but then yeah. also sort of projecting this brand and yeah. how, what's that division and what your sort of advice around that is is it separate on different platforms separate on different channels how would you approach that um just like having your brand color palette typography um and illustrations of photography having that aesthetic being played through consistently it's equally important to do that with your tone of voice as well. So if it's I in one place, it's I everywhere. If it's we in one place, it's we everywhere. Um, I started using we in 2017 when we started, even though it was just me and a couple of freelancers because, um, because it was we. And also ultimately I was building a business from scratch and I kind of wanted to appear a little bit bigger than we were just honestly <laughs> and and but it's it makes sense um but if you're someone like Lucy Parker for example she uses I because she's the craft person like she's the one person behind that brand so in her captions for social media it's like I made this I made that and like it's I think in, important to be honest so mm. I th yeah, I think it is a lot of uh, makers from our experience, you know, you may see somebody who says their name, this studio does this. Yeah. But from my perspective in the sort of comms department, I think people really like that, the eye, you know, the real yeah. person, the person making it is also reflecting yeah. their authenticity through their captioning and their social yeah. media dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Can I quickly, oh, yeah. sorry. I just, I just thought, have you heard of Studio Ashby? She's an interior designer. Yes. And I guess like they have their professional page which is um studio ashby on instagram is like i'm sure that they would use the word we because it's a huge team like medium-sized team and then on her personal page if she has one i guess that then she'd be using i so that's a, that's a differentiation as well if you are a craft person and you really want to grow or appear bigger than you are then perhaps have we as a studio and then have your personal account Great, thank you. Um, another um, another question about audiences and how you, it, you know, this might come up in customer profile session actually we've got in the future, but how do you sort of reach new audiences without alienating your existing audiences through your brand values? 
Um, I think you have to not care. Like you're not gonna be all things to all people. So you just have to hone in on speaking to that particular audience. Um, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And then um, obviously for lots of sole traders, they might not have the budget to work with, you know, fantastic creatives. Yeah. What, what would you advise for sort of logos and idents and the sort of visual identity that sort of represents your brand values if you've got limited budget? Yeah. So if you could spend a bit of time putting pen to paper and getting clear on all of the things that we've just talked about, then go over to Pinterest and think about a mood board um, that represents all of that written content and all of the ethos behind your brand um or the ethos behind your brand and maybe there's a really good course called business class and um i mentioned sophia amaruso a couple of times and um it's it's about two thousand dollars but it's such a good investment because she takes you through like loads of different um modules and i just think that it's probably worth going on a course like that or something similar and really spending time on developing everything over months I think people underestimate the time that they can launch sometimes they're like I've got an idea it's going to launch in a couple of months but there's so many components involved especially with product-based businesses mm. Yeah, and just to, can I just jump in on that, having Crafts Council rebranded fairly recently, I suppose, logo, yes, it's important, visual identity is important, but actually, it's about the values, and that's the foundation, because that comes through all your social media and, and your website, and actually, yes, of course, the logo is important, but really, it's what we're talking about, about authenticity and brand values. Mm. Um, can I, Caroline, I've got a question, time for one more question. Um, yeah, well, I was just, uh, just going to add on to that. Um, I think um, for many makers or craft businesses that uh, are working in isolation, I think there is a, a really big challenge um, to try and do this by themselves, especially yeah. if they don't have the budget to work with a, a company like yourselves, Alexandra. And and I think this is where your, your peer groups can sort of get together. If you are a, a similar stage or reaching out uh, direct messaging through um, your, your social channels or your, through your emails and just uh, saying, hey, anybody out there struggling yourselves, do you want to get together and maybe have a quarterly meetup to kind of help bounce ideas and, and uh, obviously want people to come from the same place. But I think having that peer support input from people that are at a similar stage to you yeah. um, can really help because I agree, Alexandra, having that mood board, whether it's Pinterest or if you like to work in the traditional side uh, style of analog, um, I think can really hone in on those finer details, but actually you still want somebody to bounce those ideas off. So yeah, yeah definitely recommend that. Um, yeah, uh, and, and sorry, Jill. Yes, we definitely have time for another question. Right. OK, so the other question, I think this is really interesting, is how do you stay authentic when also potentially responding to trends, which is often what media are looking for? You know, it's how you sort of get seen maybe under certain sort of hashtags or style. So what's your advice on that? That's also a really interesting one. And I guess. Um, have a product or a service that you that you know that you love and can stand behind it and it gets you up in the morning and you want to put your all in and then I don't know there's references everywhere if you don't want to blend in with the crowd I recommend like reading books and like going to museums and galleries when they're all open again maybe they are already um but just getting inspiration from other places because you're not going to be original if you're like looking um in that kind of vortex that is of instagram yeah yeah um and i think um just in in addition to that i think um i agree jill there's lots of trends going around but if you're truly authentic trends come around quite quickly um and and so there might be say two or three opportunities that are in front of you and you think oh i can't see anything else that is relevant to me these aren't quite but i'm going to try and do some work around this because I need some work. If it's not really authentic to you or not going to help your business grow, then you could be spending energy shoehorning yourself into a particular trend or area 
And then when the actual real opportunity comes through, then um, you miss it or you don't have time for it because you're already caught up. And, and I'm thinking about, we've got a, a talk uh, later on this evening for our crafts magazine subscribers. And Jakob van der Burgel is, is somebody that really stayed authentic to um, his, his brand, his ideals, and, and just thought, I'm gonna focus on the opportunities that are really for me. And if I can't find them, if they're not appearing, I'm gonna make them, them myself. myself. And, and he did, he, he formed residencies and collaborations and, and, and opportunities through organizations that he said, these are gonna be with my brand and give me um, that, that sort of financial opportunity that I need, that promotional opportunity that I need, that creative growth opportunity that I need. So I think just to think about that, um, uh, back to what you were saying, Alexandra, authenticity isn't it that seems to be a real buzzword here yeah for sure and um if you feel like you haven't got that much to say about your product and think about what influences it or what you're really really interested in and then maybe make that um part of that story and maybe integrate that into what you're creating maybe but like there's a lot of components and i know that each business or each individual who's come here has a reason for what they're doing and you probably know deep down why you're doing it so yeah yeah i also wanted to sort of pull in uh, something here that i know is really challenging for craft businesses um is that imposter syndrome yeah. um and and sort of thinking of um you're trying to identify your brand values and and time and time again i'm i hear people not been it charging enough because they're feeling like an imposter and 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 I suppose do you have any advice about that at all yeah for sure people are gonna only value you as much as you value yourself so just use that as a rule of thumb and never give discounts I've done it in the past and um it doesn't end happily for anybody because you know you're always like kind of giving so much and you you the client doesn't feel as though they're um they just don't value it as as much and it's really basic psychology so yeah yeah really really nice thank you yeah. very much um so i think we've we've definitely got some uh key takeaways there yeah um and um sorry jill did you have a question here in the the chat no, I accidentally uh, thought I'd answered somebody's question about how to keep on top of everything, which I think we'll probably cover in future talks about social media. I think there's a lot you can do with scheduling um, tools and, and things like that. So I think we'll probably cover that. So, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I think key takeaways is, um, yeah, identifying the why, mm -hmm. the, po the purpose, the how, the process, um, authenticity of your brand being really true to yourself yeah valuing yourself I really like that definitely yeah. so important and I like what you just said about the process that could be your why you know just the fact that you love the process it's almost enough so, yeah. yeah yeah and and um just thinking um about the the start and sort of um I know I, I said at the start about the, the why in relation to your whole business and setting a vision and goals to that yeah. Um, and the question that came up in the chat from Jill about how you define yourself as an I or a we. Yeah. And back to you, Alexandra, with your business, um, you obviously had that ambition. It's going to be a team. It's going to be a we. So yeah. when you were working out your brand and brand values, did you set goals and a vision for the future to align to? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was, I think, why I, I had the audacity to say, we do this and we do that although it was a very small team in the beginning um because if you if you if you believe that that's gonna happen it is and it does so it's all about manifesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah brilliant yeah. awesome and it, it's yeah. you know it's worked you've grown a really really strong business and you support yeah. other businesses um yeah. and it will continue to grow yeah thank you 
Thank you. Thank you so much um, for being our guest today and kicking off uh, this series of talks. This is being funded by Crafting Europe, um, a project with uh, eight other European countries to in, improve um, the, the support for craft businesses across Europe. Um, so it's really exciting to be a part of that. Um, and our next talk is um, on the 19th of May, there's still tickets available. Uh, we'll be discussing how to identify your ideal uh, customer and those that customer profile. And alongside that, um, those of you who might be familiar with our research at the Crafts Council, we produced uh, the Market for Craft report in 2020. We now have an interactive toolkit so you can actually um, produce your own reports relevant to your own customer profiles. And we'll be talking about that on the 19th. It's a really great tool. So um, yeah, do, do come along for that. Before um, we leave you today, I'm going to ask you to um, respond to our poll uh, to see if you've enjoyed the talk um, and how it's it supported your, your business today. Um, and if you've got any comments for us, um, pop them in the, the chat or um, you can email us at makerdev at craftscouncil.org. UK. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much, Alexandra, um, for being our guest. And thank you for everyone else for listening. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time, Wednesday, the 19th um, uh, at one o'clock. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen so you can see that slide.